first of all introduce you to our Vice Chancellor, Vicky, who's going to give us a couple words. Uh, and then uh, after that, it will be Pat Baxton. I have it written up there, the time element. So you can go ahead and have as much time as you I need about time. an hour. An hour? <laughs> <laughs> Let's Google that. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, my job is to welcome you on behalf of Indiana University Northwest, and um, I need to say this is an exciting month, and it is a month, um, and I think the topic is of the highest order. The topic is demystifying government. Oh my God, that's a big one. I don't know if you're gonna. It, we're, it's very, very tough, tough goal to reach. The Coalition of Urban and Metropolitan Universities is a national organization dedicated to connecting urban universities like IU Northwest and their partners together with the Democracy, Democracy Collaborative, which is a national research institute which develops strategies for a more democratic economy. Have de those two institutes have designated Indiana Uni University Northwest as one of the nation's 31 institutions of higher education, as inaugural members of the Higher Education <coughs> Anchor Mission Initiative. Those were a lot of words. This initiative is designed to develop and share new strategies for deploying higher education's intellectual and place-based resources to enhance the economic and social well-being of the communities they serve. We are very proud of this designation as it recognizes our commitment to our surrounding communities and allows us to broaden our scope and use our intellectual capital to partner with our community to address challenges and create solutions. This conference, Demystifying Government, sponsored by our School of Public and Environmental Affairs, is precisely one of the kinds of anchor activities in which we hope to engage and participate. I'm very grateful to the faculty and staff of IU Northwest School of Public and Environmental Affairs and to Ellen in our Cure Office for their celebration of Public and Environmental Affairs Month. And I look forward to continued work in partnership with all of you as we look forward to our futures together. Welcome and thank you. With that in mind, I want to introduce you to Patrick Bankston, who's uh, the Dean of the Art Department. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to lend my welcome also. I'm the Dean of the College of Health and Human Services, which uh, includes six departments, most of them health-related, and, and, and one uh, related to, uh, well, health administration, with our School of Public and Environmental Affairs, which is sponsoring this this particular event. I'm really, really proud of our School of Public and Environmental Affairs. They do a great job of, uh, of trying to let people know about our public and, and uh, issues and our environmental issues, um, as well as um, programs to uh, uh, train our health administrators, which is why it kind of connects to the rest of our health programs in the Northwest. Um, I have the privilege of being dean of that organization, Dr. Uh, Roman Lagunas was uh, is the uh, vice chancellor. Then the next down the road is dean, and then we have program directors and assistant deans, and those are hierarchical kinds of, of roles that aren't familiar to a lot of people. And as probably the way it should be, you don't need to know a lot about universities. But I say that because, in the same token, most people don't know a lot about their local government. And we, we see TV, um, and they cover things like, uh, for example, the Secretary of State nominee is having hearings today um, before, I don't remember if it's before the House or Senate, it's the Senate probably. Um, and we see that on TV, but we don't see very much uh, about our local uh, people who are running for office, politicians, and and public servants. And I do believe that public service is God's work, in spite of some of the negative publicity that we get about that. And in my time, I was county commissioner of Porter County for a short time in the 90s. And, uh, and I realized at that point that, except for some people who knew what county commissioners do and call me at five o'clock in the morning about their roads, um, most people had no idea what county commissioners do or the county council does or even the sheriff from the point of view of all of the activities 
that the sheriff is involved in, from the jail to the courts to the buildings to the security of a variety of things, SWAT teams, uh, you know, aviation things. Those are complicated jobs that require complicated uh, and uh, uh, they're difficult jobs that require uh, skill and administrative ability. And when, uh, you know, county clerk, county, county council, all of those things uh, most people don't know anything about. I don't know in Indiana whether they teach these things in school. I, I grew up in New York State and they did have some things that they taught us about, about our local government, including some of the more arcane details. But I would hope that most that more people would know about that. And, and if you think about you know the effect on your lives, the, the, the sheriff, the county commissioners, the county council, um, your mayor, your all of those offices have a huge effect on your life. Probably um, more important than the national politicians do, except you know want to want to keep us away from people blowing us up or something. But but uh, national and probably more important than the national politicians that people are not as concerned. Um, I think probably the most important, the things that draw the most attention are things like school board elections, where people want to you know, fire the football coach and, uh, and therefore get involved in those kinds of things. But uh, the public servants that I've met in Lake and Porter County, uh, for the most part, are wonderful people who sacrifice a good part of their life in order to do this. And really, uh, for relatively low pay, uh, serve us all in great positions. And so I'm hoping today um, and for the rest of Public Affairs Month for the School of Public and Environmental Affairs that more people get a, get a clue about what our local governments do and, uh, as Joe says, uh, demystify government to some extent. So thank you all for being here and I appreciate uh, you, you uh, having me here to welcome you. Thank you. I'll introduce you to Carl, Carl Beso. He's the Dean of, uh, Assistant Dean of our Department in SPIA School of Public Environmental Affairs. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Gomez-Dago. And I'd like to start by uh, thanking all of our students. And you can see a lot of them are wearing their blue shirts right now. And I think a big part of this, and I think the Vice Chancellor said it right, this is a celebration of what we do in SPIA. And SPIA, School of Public Environmental Affairs, it's a long word. Uh, maybe we can simplify that a little. Uh, us in SPIA, we're all SPIONs. Uh, if you're not a SPION already, you are a honorary SPION today. So welcome to our family. And I like the fact that Dr. Bankston was talking a little bit about uh, his history in being a, a county commissioner. Uh, before I was in academia, I actually ran a court-related nonprofit. And when I started running that organization, I was quite a bit younger. No idea all of the uh, layers, the complexity of local governance. And it really is a mystery to a lot of people. And I think when you watch uh, TV and you see what's happening at the national level, it seems like more of a mystery. So hopefully something that you'll get out of this celebration of Public Affairs Month is uh, being able to uh, see through some of the complexity uh, as well as appreciate some of the complexity of local government uh, as well as how local government interfaces with those at the uh, state level as well as the federal level and you'll be exposed to uh, speakers that will present on all those layers and what they do today uh, i think the heart of it I'll, I'll cover two things i want to leave you with uh, for one, I think the heart of what we do uh, as uh, public servants, uh, it has a lot to do with giving back to the community and uh, really being responsive to the community. And as the School of Public Environmental Affairs, uh, what we do is we really try to integrate research with practice. And I think that's a fancy way of saying that we have uh, professors in our school uh, that are actually probably a lot more better known than what a lot of people local level realize. So we have people that have published at the national level, some that are uh, recognized uh, even internationally. They actually bring that research into the classroom. Uh, so I think it's a good marriage between the two. I think the other part of that marriage really is 
this whole month of bringing in practitioners uh, really do uh, keep us honest and to uh, let us know a little bit more about, you know, like how does that research, how do you put it into action? And I think a big part of putting that into action is democracy. So essentially, as public servants, we are putting democracy into action. And I want to thank again the students, faculty at SPIA, uh, all the guests here. I know that there's at least one mom here, so that's wonderful. I want to continue to encourage you to uh, attend all of our events uh, through the whole month. So today a big uh, focus is on uh, law enforcement, uh, but we will have other presentations uh, that embrace our other programs, such as environmental policy, healthcare management, really crosses the whole gamut. So please join me in the celebration, and thank you so much for your time. I'm going to bring the key one is that the secure. Alan Sarlata worked worked hard and has been working hard in the area to bring uh, civic, civic engagement. So it's Alan Sarlata, please, please. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Faculty who are here, leadership students, and of course our public officials and employees who are spending their morning with us. Thank you for, for being here. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about IU Northwest faculty and SPIA, uh, faculty and student and community engagement. You may or may not know that we have a center at our campus that is focused on building community university partnerships and that center is in service to all of those constituencies. Faculty who want to work with our community partners, including local government, students who want the experience of being engaged in um, applied learning, and of course community, which is concerned with actually addressing the issues that we have on a regular basis that are of concern to us. So, Cure on our campus that works collaboratively with different organizations. We promote learning from students, beneficial partnership, mutually beneficial partnerships, and we're really focused on finding solutions. So you might ask, well, how do we do that? Our faculty and students on the campus um, work with us through the center, and um, Dr. Basil gave you a few examples, to identify the issues that are concerned to the community, or community comes to us and says, look, um, we have these issues that we're interested in getting resolved, and we help match up our interests with the expertise and faculty so that we can address these issues. Some things that you may be familiar with are the crime data mapping project, which right. started out of the Center for Urban and Regional Excellence. I think police law enforcement are familiar with that project. We have healthcare um, projects in our community. We work with social service agencies, environmental organizations, health agencies, and um, I would encourage you, if you are interested and have concerns, to come to the Center for Urban and Regional Excellence, learn more about what we do, and um, hopefully we'll move forward on a path to working together to resolve the issues and concerns in the Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, now it comes to the, the big event. Now let me say this before we begin with the big event. Uh, like I made an announcement Wednesday, I'm gonna make it again. My wife doesn't like it, but uh, June 24th, I'm running from Gary to Indianapolis. Running, not walking, from Gary to Indianapolis to bring awareness on civic education. One day, just that day? No, start that day and, and ending. No, that's a good point. It is. It is. Uh, actually, hopefully, uh, my benchmark is to uh, be in Indianapolis. July 4th, which is symbolic of our, our when we actually became America. So uh, I'd like to make sure so that we can raise civic awareness. Now with that, having said that, I'd like to first of all introduce uh, Mr. Oscar, Sheriff Oscar Martinez, who's actually, he's been doing a lot of things in the area right now, but uh, most of all, I think he will probably explain to you what he's doing more than, uh, I think you have your, in your flyer and in your brochure what he's all about, uh, again, uh, and also, I hopefully I'm going to have to contact the U.S. Attorney to see when he's going to come in and talk with Gerson. Go ahead, sir. It's, it's all you show now. Uh, Thank you. Here it is. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are you and students and faculty and the public? One, two, three. Yeah. Uh, my name is Oscar Martinez. I'm uh, your Lake County Sheriff. 
Uh, what I'm going to do is just go uh, through, uh, talk about the Lake County Sheriff's Department. So a lot of people don't really understand what the Sheriff's Department does, what the responsibilities are. And uh, when, when I go through, I'm, it's just going to be a quick uh, run through. I'll have uh, my command staff and uh, other officers up here to explain exactly what they do. Uh, but you'll see that the Lake County Sheriff's uh, Department is unique. It's unlike any other police department. Uh, one thing I am proud of is that we do have partnerships with uh, uh, ed educational institutions, uh, IUN, Purdue, Calumet College, and uh, you know we do internships on uh, with criminal justice uh, majors. But we're taking it a step further now. What we're doing also, because you'll see, we're like a, a, a city. Uh, we have a budget that's probably higher than some of the cities here in Lake County. And uh, one of the things that we're going to start doing is doing, uh, uh, we have done it in the past, is internship and with nursing. Because we do have a medical uh, uh, staff and uh, operation here in our jail. Also dealing with mental health and social work. So we're going to open it up uh, more than just uh, criminal justice. So we're going to get involved with a vast variety of uh, different type of majors in education. The uh, Sheriff's Department budget is around $31 million. Uh, like I said, it's like a little city. Uh, I can't do this alone. It's the people that you surround yourself with, the administration, your chief of police, deputy chief of police, your command staff, that helps me out to run this little city here. Can't do it alone. Uh, it's uh, all based on who you have helping you, who you surround yourself with, and uh, they've done a great job. Uh, the Sheriff's Department uh, has a patrol division. We patrol mainly the unincorporated areas uh, because they have no uh, police uh, force, so we do patrol the unincorporated areas. However, we do also patrol inside municipalities. Uh, we're a resource uh, for other agencies uh, if they need our assistance, and uh, especially in high crime areas. We have a traffic investigation unit and also a canine unit uh, that we're very proud of. Uh, many municipalities call upon our crash investigators to investigate uh, serious bodily injury accidents or, or fatalities uh, because we have a pretty great uh, unit there. We have the jail. Uh, the jail, that's like the biggest uh, uh, you know, responsibility there in the Sheriff's Department. Uh, we deal with correction officers there. Uh, we have a, a medical division there, uh, like a hospital. Uh, we have mental health and different type of programs there. Uh, one of the programs that I'm, I'm proud to talk about is, because we're dealing with the opioid problem of what's going on around this, uh, this nation. Uh, Indiana is ranked number 17th in, in the nation in opioid uh, uh, overdose deaths. And when you look at the surrounding counties, about seven years ago, we always thought the heroin or opioid problem was more of a Porter County, LaPorte County, Southern area. But uh, Porter County, I believe, had 25 overdose deaths in uh, 2016. And in 2017, they had 30. When you compare that to Lake County, in 2016, we had 114 overdose deaths. And uh, just last year, it nearly went up 100% to about 210 overdose deaths. Now these are the people who overdose and die. That's not even keeping track of those who almost died, uh, that, that OD'd and we were able to save their lives. It's, it's, it's an epidemic here. It's, it's killing a lot of people. It's not uh, what you see in the movies that it's junkies or prostitutes or, or people like that. They're everyday people, business owners, uh, professionals, uh, uh, union workers. These are, uh, this is a problem I feel, in my opinion, like a pharmaceutical problem. Uh, doctors over prescribing uh, painkillers. Uh, the, the people getting addicted to painkillers. And, and what happens when you lose your job because you're, you're addicted to drugs, uh, you go onto a cheaper drug, which is heroin. So that's the, 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 the link there between opioids and, 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 uh, and heroin there. So when you're addicted to these drugs, we all know that uh, uh, these individuals uh, uh, will steal, I mean, from their own family, from uh, wh wherever they can get the money to sustain their habit. And uh, even though we have programs to educate and, and have a partnership with the community and awareness, we do get a lot of uh, individuals that come into our jail that are addicted to, to opioids. 
So we have a great opportunity to, to try to help these uh, uh, victims that are addicted to uh, uh, the opioid. So well, the, uh, we, I partner up with uh, Judge Cantrell and Judge Shirelli, uh, uh, also with the prosecutors, so we can see if we can have a program where there could be an alternative for prosecution. Uh, we also have it on a volunteer basis that they go through a, uh, a recovery program through our jail. Now, the Vivitrol program is unique because uh, what happens with Vivitrol is that well, as soon as a person is booked into our jail, they go through medical, they're evaluated, uh, then they go through uh, mental health to see if they're a candidate for Vivitrol. Because Vivitrol doesn't work for everyone. Uh, they're, they, they're evaluated to see if they have the uh, uh, motivation to change, to see if they're uh, depressed or suicidal. And a lot of tests go uh, uh, on medical tests uh, with the liver because that does affect uh, uh, the liver, Vivitrol. If they pass all those requirements and, and they're a candidate for this program, once they go through the recovery part, detox, and they're clean, just before their re-entry program back into society, they're given a shot of Vivitrol. Now, Vivitrol costs about $1,800, uh, and it's expensive, but we, I was able to work out with the company to get the first dosage in our jail for free. So once that dosage is given to you, uh, it, it lasts for 28 days. So what Vivitrol does, it blocks the opioid receptors in your brain so you don't get that euphoria. Uh, it works with alcohol. It lasts for 28 days. So what it, it, it does, it starts conditioning your brain not to need the substance. Some people are on it a little, a little bit longer than others. Uh, how is it gonna be paid? Uh, once they're out. Well, we have uh, grants and, and organizations like Recovery Works uh, that we can work with. Uh, we start the process with Medicaid, their application to, uh, while they're in our jail, so when they're released, we can get that activated. And uh, I think uh, it, it's a better program than how, it's my own opinion, than using Suboxone or Methadone, which that creates a dependency. That you get addicted to, that is abuse. It keeps you on a tapered high. So uh, we do have about 40 candidates that are going through it. Uh, I see a huge success rate on it and I look forward to moving forward on it. Uh, and that was just the jail part. Uh, we have a warrant division that, uh, that uh, goes after uh, people that are wanted, usually felony warrants, and uh, we hunt them down. We work along with uh, the U.S. Marshal Service. We do have officers assigned uh, to the federal task force with the U.S. Marshals. Uh, we're responsible for this uh, sex registry for sex offenders to, uh, to keep them registered, to check up on them, to see if uh, uh, when they come into our area that they're registered, that uh, everything matches up with where they live, the cars are registered to them. Uh, we also have special operations, which our commander is here. Special operation deals with the Marine Unit. Uh, we have a Marine Unit that patrols uh, the waters of Lake Michigan and he'll explain to you just what their responsibilities are, especially during the summer. Uh, the aviation units, uh, we have helicopters. Uh, we have helicopters that are used to help uh, officers track somebody, surveillance, uh, to uh, uh, search and rescue. And you'll see the, uh, the helicopters are outside. Uh, we have two different ones. One is a Eurocopter with a, a camera, a FLIR system. Uh, that can uh, attract people and then we have what we, uh, the Huey, the big helicopter uh, that uh, is also used for fire. So we have a Bambi bucket that we fill up with water and put out fires where, fire, uh, where it's difficult for fire departments to get through because of drain. Uh, we also uh, going to start using where we have a crane for search and rescue and also to mobilize uh, canine or SWAT uh, units into areas that uh, will be difficult to get into. I'm uh, very proud of that division and, uh, and it's very impressive. Uh, we have the Drug Task Force. The Drug Task Force uh, uh, is broken up into different types of uh, divisions there. We have the uh, interdiction units that work the highway, they intercept drugs uh, uh, on the highway that are being transported into Chicago or into this area and drug proceeds that are going back to the drug cartels. Uh, we have Commander uh, Villarreal here that will do a PowerPoint. Very impressive. You'll see uh, hidden compartment techniques on how they smuggle the drugs. Uh, they're highly trained officers, and uh, I mean, it's impressive when you see what, what they've done. Uh, we have the high crime unit, and that's uh, a unit that, that uh, goes out to municipalities that we target as high crime, or we get complaints of 
uh, gang or drug activities. And then we'll go into those areas uh, and do extra enforcement uh, to help the, those municipalities. Uh, we also have uh, the canine division that's in patrol, but we also have uh, uh, Mari, I believe. Mari? Mari. Mari. I say Mari, Mari. You say tomato, I say tomato. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we, uh, that, uh, that's a canine dog. Uh, it's uh, passive alert uh, when it indicates that there's drugs, right? It's passive, not yes. uh, I like passive dogs because uh, when you're searching a vehicle or something and you have uh, like an aggressive alert where they're scratching, the, they're, they're indicating where the drugs may be at. And uh, man, I just don't like when they're scratching on property kind of day. I like passive dogs. They sit down, they alert to where the narcotics is at. Uh, this was purchased, uh, or pretty much given to us uh, through IDEA, uh, the Indiana Drug Enforcement Association. So uh, we look for ways to save taxpayers money. Uh, and we got the dog uh, uh, thanks to IDEA. The, uh, it's assigned to the Drug Task Force and it's a great asset to have uh, in that unit. We also have the intelligence unit that I created uh, that gathers intelligence on homicides, intelligence through our jail, through gang activities, so we can uh, collect all that intelligence, use it for our investigation, and sometimes investigations will be long term where uh, you know people think that we're not doing anything, but we are, it takes time. Uh, instead of just trying to arrest one person, we like to get an, an organization or a group of people to, to prosecute or to arrest. Uh, we have the civil division that we're in charge of. Uh, the civil division deals with writ of assistance, protective orders, evictions, tax warrants, state tax warrants, small claims, foreclosures, protective orders. We auction off homes, and that is the response, among so many other things, that is the responsibility of the sheriff's department. Uh, we have our crime lab. Very proud of our crime lab. Uh, it's CSI, like uh, the kids know from from the TV. Uh, and they do uh, the crime scene investigations and they are utilized throughout the county. We have a top-notch crime scene, uh, or crime lab uh, unit here in the Sheriff's Department. We have the investigation division uh, that deals with uh, homicides, white-collar crimes. We do investigate other jurisdictions upon their request. Uh, New Chicago had a double homicide that they requested the Lake County Sheriff's Department uh, to, to take over the investigations. And that's only because we have the resources uh, uh, available uh, and training and investigators to handle such crimes like that. Uh, we have also officers, uh, two officers assigned to the Metro Homicide Unit, uh, along with Gary, assisting them on their uh, homicide investigation. And uh, I'll have, I have my invest, uh, commander of investigations, uh, Michael Stewart, he'll talk about that. And he'll talk about uh, something that uh, I'm proud that uh, he, uh, you know, took it, took charge of, of the red flag uh, uh, law, uh, wrote up some affidavits that uh, is being adopted by our prosecutors and other uh, agencies, and that's a, a seizure of weapons. He'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, animal control, you know, animal control is not easy. We, um, we don't have enough funds, uh, not enough people to work there, and uh, it's a big responsibility. Uh, it's a no-kill shelter. Uh, we do adoptions, uh, spade and neutering, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's a big task. Uh, I'm proud of what they're doing there. Uh, we could do more, and we expect to do more. I've just been here six months, and uh, we're, we're doing a lot, but we can't forget the animal control because uh, that's important. Uh, we have SWAT, our tactical unit that conducts drug raids or, or any type of raid or hostage situation, uh, not just for the Sheriff's Department, but for other municipalities that request us. And then we have our special victims unit uh, that deals with uh, investigations of domestic violence, that deals with uh, 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 children, sexual assault. Uh, again, they are one of the best in this area. Uh, they, we have officers that are trained, uh, highly trained in forensic interviewing and that's uh, a specific skill and training to have when you're interviewing children uh, and we're the only ones in Lake County that have uh, forensic interviewers uh, for children and uh, they go to Alabama for that training and uh, that facility trains globally, not just here in the United States. And uh, we've been used by Homeland Security, by other agencies as far as California. So we're very proud of that, uh, uh, that unit. With that uh, being said, 
the sheriff's department, it's a large department. There's a lot that, that's why it's about 31, 35 million dollar budget. And uh, well, no one person can do it alone. So I'm pleased uh, to have uh, the command staff that I have, the administration that I have, and I think you'll be impressed on, uh, on what they have to share. I think we're gonna go with Bill uh, Rio first, with yes, narcotics. Yes, okay, sir. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Commander Bill Rio. He's the commander of uh, narcotics and uh, or the drug task force, and he's gonna go ahead and uh, talk to you a little bit about what we do here in the Sheriff's Department. I'll go ahead while he's uh, getting this hooked up. As we all know, uh, you know, the Lake County Sheriff's Department has been uh, going through some problems and challenges that, uh, that has uh, uh, given the Sheriff's Department a black eye. Uh, we're under a Department of Justice oversight in our jail. Uh, we have been for quite some time. Uh, that is costing taxpayers millions of dollars. And uh, one of the top two uh, issues with the Department of Justice was that we didn't have a professional jail administrator, a jail warden, and a psychiatric nurse practitioner that needed to be in place there. So uh, I am proud to say that we did hire a psychiatric nurse practitioner. That's a unique field. It's very hard, especially uh, you know, with the guidelines and requirements from the Department of Justice, just to find that right qualified uh, uh, individual. Uh, also, the uh, jail warden. We did a nationwide search uh, for a professional jail administrator. It took quite some time. Uh, we interviewed uh, jail administrators from California, Nevada, Florida, New York, Chicago, uh, and uh, New Hampshire. And just recently, I'm sure you've seen the, the press release, that we did hire a professional jail administrator uh, from New Hampshire. He will be starting uh, April 30th. Uh, I'm very proud uh, to have him on board. He's very experienced and, uh, you know, another thing that we, we were always labeled here in Lake County about politics. Uh, this individual comes from uh, the outside, has no political connections here in, in this area. He's just a true professional that will get the job done, hold uh, uh, our uh, uh, department and, and individuals there uh, accountable. Uh, and uh, and trained, so uh, I look forward for uh, for the uh, Mr. Zink, Zink uh, to start April 30th, and uh, what a relief that is, because uh, running that jail is no easy task, especially when uh, as a sheriff with the help of the administration to uh, juggle you know both sides. Uh, it's great to have that uh, board in there to, to handle a lot of the issues there. So. should know students and uh, faculty and the public. Go ahead. Now let me introduce you to Villa Rio. Uh, this is an exciting, uh, I would say an exciting uh, program right now because you're going to see what they, what's, what the challenges that we have here. He's hyping it up and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> First can I ask your students to sure. come over here? Everyone, at least everyone that's wearing a blue shirt, you guys come down here. I think it's better so we don't have to speak so loud. <laughs> I know the place is full. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Commander Villarreal. I'm the Sheriff's Commander of the Lake County Drug Task Force. Um, I'm responsible for the command of the Highway Interdiction Unit, the Narcotics, Undercover Narcotics Unit, the High Crime Unit, and the Criminal Intelligence Unit. Um, I'm an 18-year veteran of the police department. Uh, I spent approximately 10 years working narcotics in each division, whether it's been on the interdiction unit, uh, gang street crimes, or the uh, undercover narcotics. I worked hand-in-hand -hand with the sheriff. Uh, I was trained directly underneath him, so uh, I worked with him from 2003 to 2007, and and ultimately all my undercover work's been in some way or fashion been with with the sheriff uh, Martinez. So um, 
Commander Stewart is here as well. He's uh, he's also part of the Highway Interdiction Unit um, uh, with uh, the cooperation of, of us two and some of the new officers that we put on board. We've been able to bring back the, uh, the Highway Interdiction Unit to where where it needs to be, and we're, we plan to actually expand it and make it even more uh, efficient here in the near future. So. Um, So the Drug Task Force, uh, we're located right here across the street, here at the Sheriff's Department. Uh, it consists of, for the most part, three main units. It's the High Crime Unit, which the Sheriff kind of uh, uh, mentioned a little bit or uh, talked about a little bit. The High Crime Unit is comprised of about five officers, or five detectives, one sergeant, and they patrol high crime areas. Um, and that could be anywhere. That could be in the city, unincorporated areas. Uh, we get a lot of requests to be in the city of Gary because of the high homicide rate, uh, and the violent crimes that are in Gary. But we patrol in Hammond or East Chicago, uh, wherever we need to be. Uh, we're also in the South County because of the different heroin and opioid problems that we have. So not only are we going after gang and violent offenders, but we're also trying to get those that are distributing narcotics, heroin, opioids in South County, whether it's in Winfield, St. John, Sherrillville, or as far, far down south as Lowell, uh, they will work in those areas. So, but for the most part, uh, they are in high crime areas because we get a lot of requests to be in those, those areas. Oh, I'm sorry. So the high crime unit, uh, I'll read this to you because I put this, I put this little thing together. The high crime unit works to reduce gang violence, violent offenders, narcotic related issues throughout Lake County and the surrounding areas. We achieve this goal by partnering with outside agencies and staying proactive in the fight. With the teamwork of the entire department, the Lake County Drug Task Force High Crime Unit is able to make an impact and bring criminals to justice. So these are just some little highlights that I, that I put uh, for that unit. Uh, they. They are involved with gang activity, illegal narcotics, guns, warrants, illegal proceeds, stolen cars. We get a lot of stolen cars. The high crime unit just, uh, they, they either run into or they'll see vehicles that are uh, either ditched off to the side of the road or they make traffic stop and those vehicles are stolen here. And many of those vehicles are stolen from Illinois and they bring them here into Indiana. Uh, like I mentioned before, it's one sergeant supervisor and there's five detectives. We also have two canines assi assigned to the unit. Two, uh, two, uh, two dogs, one's a narcotics dog. It's not Mari, but we have one, one narcotics dog, a German Shepherd, and we also have a uh, Belgian Malinois. He's a shepherd, and we have a shepherd uh, uh, tracking dog that's assigned to the unit. So. If you have any questions, go ahead and, you know, you can interrupt me and raise your hand. Uh, we have the narcotics unit. Uh, the narcotics unit is comprised of undercover detectives that are in plain clothes. Uh, you would not know that they're police officers, but they, uh, their job is to infiltrate the, the drug world. And that's with working with informants, uh, following up on narcotics related arrests, um, they may even do some undercover um, work themselves where they're actually dealing with the drug dealer. And the drug dealer doesn't even know that they're, you know that they're working with the police. But uh, the narcotics unit, uh, the narcotics unit, uh, they focus on narcotic distributors, illegal narcotics, guns, illegal proceeds. Uh, there's one sergeant supervisor to that unit and there's five undercover detectives. These are some examples of some of the things that we've gotten in the last couple of years. Um, first slide is a marijuana grow operation. We had information that, uh, that there was some marijuana being sold uh, and distributed out of a house in, this one was in Gary. Um, we followed up on it, we did surveillance on it, 24-hour uh, surveillance on it. We were able to uh, 
follow some vehicles back and forth from different locations that we knew were narcotic related. We made a few traffic stops. We were getting some drugs out of those, uh, those traffic stops. Utilizing the high crime unit and the narcotics uh, investigators were able to get a search warrant and we we ended up getting a, uh, when we did the search warrant, this is what we found. Uh, there's uh, some money, drugs, these are all different uh, search warrant related arrests. Then there's the interdiction unit. Uh, the interdiction unit is uh, comprised of uh, four detectives right now. Uh, I'll read this. The interdiction unit is dedicated to work in the interstates that travel through Lake County and the surrounding areas. We achieve this goal by aggressively going after criminals that are trafficking drugs, weapons, illegal U.S. currency, contraband, and staying proactive in the fight. With the teamwork of the entire Lake County Drug Task Force, the interdiction unit is able to make an impact and bring criminals to justice. I think this is a good time to bring up Mari because I think Mari wants to leave and wants to go outside on this nice <laughs> Mari's display on this picture, she assisted uh, on, uh, on a traffic stop that actually Commander Stewart made on Interstate 65. Um, this vehicle was uh, uh, Commander Stewart's investigation on the side of the road uh, led him to believe that they were doing some illegal criminal activity. Uh, when we searched the vehicle, we found some inconsistencies up in, inside the vehicle. I don't want to get into too specifics, but we utilized Mari. Uh, we brought the vehicle here to the police garage. We utilized Mari, and lo and behold, there was over $100,000 uh, hidden inside the car. I'm sorry, this is Detective Ramos. <laughs> <laughs> Mari was purchased, like the sheriff said, through the Indiana Drug Enforcement Association, so it, paid, it was at free to the sheriff's department. It was at no cost to us or the taxpayers. Um, and one of the prerequisites to, to getting Mari is that uh, we needed to have an interdiction unit. We did, we, put one, we had one already, we put one in place, and uh, they assisted us. I told them that we need, we were looking for a passive uh, canine to work uh, we don't always need a apprehension dog or an aggressive type of dog. So uh, we, we asked for a passive dog to hang out at the office with us uh, and just be part of the team. And uh, Detective Ramos uh, was able to get Mari and Mari is highly trained and she's, she's part of the team. So um, that's how we got Mari. So, so Detective Ramos, if you wish, you could come over here. Leave it's up to you. I know Mari wants to maybe get out of here, but we cry the whole time. Uh, just wants to work. <laughs> been here it's been on and off for different reasons but the interdiction unit was formed back in 1998 by the current sheriff Oscar Martinez Jr. Through the years of hard work Commander Villarreal, myself and Commander Stewart uh, who were trained under Sheriff Martinez have continued the advancement of the Lake County Sheriff's interdiction unit. The unit today is comprised of four detectives that are highly trained in being able to detect those that are committing criminal activity on the interstates. These detectives are trained in roadside interview skills which will enable them to detect criminal activity. These detectives have specialized training in locating hidden compartments and vehicles that are used to transport contraband. The interdiction has a canine unit, which is Mark. So uh, I'll touch a little bit on this. Uh, I didn't know what audience we were going to have. We were going to have police officers or lawyers, defense attorneys, or but it looks like we have, for the majority, just students and some professionals. So I'll just touch a little base on this. Well, that's a picture there of, uh, of a seizure that uh, Commander Stewart and I were on, on the toll road, and we made a traffic stop on this vehicle a couple of years back. And uh, the interview, uh, we knew something was going on, and when we, we 
took a peek underneath the bed. It was over 500 pounds of marijuana underneath the vehicle. Uh, these are just, uh, this is just a highlight picture of, uh, of the United States and some of the interstates that run, well, all the interstates that run through our country. And then we get more specific to the interstates that come through our area. So if you notice uh, on the left hand slide, you have uh, Interstate 94 and Interstate 90 that uh, tap into Chicago make its way through Indiana. So if you could if you if you could imagine in your mind that drugs have to move from point A to point B, uh, they ultimately here in this area, Chicago is a, a, a major distribution point. Uh, so a lot of the drugs that come from the border make its way, it makes its way into the into the Chicago land and from the Chicago land it gets distributed out. Uh, South Bend, Indianapolis uh, major cities in Ohio, Cincinnati, Columbus, Toledo. So all those uh, the, those interstates uh, are are used to transport these large amounts of drugs. <coughs> 90 and 94 come right through here every day as we speak, 24 hours a day. There's things that are moving on that interstate, so there's a lot of criminal activity that occurs on those interstates. Um, Traffic stop, um, number one question we always get is, how did you know there was, a, there, there was drugs in the car? Well, the answer to that is, we don't know. Uh, that's why we're making traffic stops. And we're making legal traffic stops. Um, uh, we make uh, you know, hundreds of traffic stops throughout the week. Well, maybe not just one week, but throughout the month, we'll make hundreds of traffic stops. We interact with the driver. We'll speak with the driver, we'll ask simple questions of, of, of where are you coming from and where are you going, and, and speak to the, to the passengers of the vehicle. Um, I'm not gonna give all the secrets out, but we have skills on being able to uh, detect if someone's actually doing some criminal activity. Uh, if I stop uh, uh, one of you ladies there and you tell me you're coming back from IU or you're going here, going to work and so forth, I'm probably going to believe you and I'm not going to have any reason to to uh, sponsor your vehicle. But if we stop somebody that uh, you know doesn't know who the car belongs to, doesn't really know where they're going, they have a quick trip, you know, that kind of brings red flags to us and we'll, we'll further investigate that and to, to determine on why it is that you're on our interstate that is coming through, through Lake County. So, um, could I ask a question? Sure. I've always been amazed when you read the paper about when you stop one of these guys, usually for one of the violations that you talk about there, and then you, you find the drugs. But these guys just are damn stupid that they don't even <laughs> obey the speeding laws and lane changes. I mean, if they drove safely, they wouldn't have a problem, would they? Well, that's true. Um, yes, they are that stupid. <laughs> 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 But uh, you know what, uh, we, we focus on, uh, you know, if, if someone's transporting uh, you know, 500 pounds of marijuana, they're not gonna be doing 100 miles an hour over, over on the interstate. So we're gonna be looking for a number of factors on the highway. Um, speeding may be one of them, following too closely may be another. One of the things that, uh, that highlight shows is a change of human behavior. It's not uncommon to see somebody uh, uh, you're driving and, and all of a sudden they see a police car from the distance and they tuck in between two semi-trucks to, in essence, hide from us, even though there's really nowhere to hide on the interstate. Uh, it's not like you could turn off on a street somewhere, so they really have nowhere to go. So that brings attention to us. Uh, so there's a number of factors. I mean, we, we look at different things, license plates, uh, you know, origins of city, of, uh, specifically where that plate's Register to. So there's a number of factors. It's just not one thing that we just make a you know make a traffic stop on and go from there. So a multiple things that we kind of look at that that uh, that throw red flags and uh, you know and we, if there's something that we feel is, uh, is is not you know there's some illegal activity going on we'll we'll continue to pull on that string. 
and so we act, we get to the bottom of it as opposed to just you know giving a ticket at the window or a warning and then letting them go. We're gonna we're gonna investigate. You know, so it's it's dangerous work, and uh, but it's uh, high. You know, we're, we're, we we train well, and the sheriff has has he's trained as well on it, and we've we've gone through training. Uh, all over the country to be able to excel on, on you know, on the highways. You know, so, okay. well, you have to look at 8094. Uh, speed limit there is 55. Nobody's doing the average speed is 70. Uh, so it's making a high volume traffic stops. Uh, you don't always get something, but we're trained and we know who the innocent motoring public is. Now, getting pulled over, even sometimes when I'm off duty, I see the red and blue lights and I'm getting pulled over, you're like, oh geez, you know? Uh, and, and I'm a police officer. Now imagine if you have 25 kilos of cocaine in a hidden compartment or in the trunk. So we look at uh, body, emotion. Uh, uh, those are things you cannot control. You can't control that. Uh, and uh, the nervousness, the level of nervousness, nervousness uh, the heart rate, the cotton mouth, the the, uh, the sweating, you know, just uh, just imagine when you were a kid and you're getting called into the dean's office. Now what, you know? Uh, so that's elevated, you know, a hundred times. Uh, so if we look at all those little indicators. So that's what we call it, indicators. Uh, but it's just making high volume traffic stops and, uh, and people will think, you know, they, they, all our traffic stops are videotaped as well. Uh, when I first started back in the early 90s, uh, uh, and I went to court, I won my cases, but the question was, there's no way he gave you consent to search that vehicle, uh, it, it, minus probable cause. Uh, so I'm like, I, they did, they did give me consent, so I wanted a video camera and put it in my car, and they were amazed just how many uh, people will give consent, uh, you know, different types of reason, because they feel, well, the police officer's going to search it anyway. Or if I say no, I'm going to look guilty. Or that uh, I've been stopped before and no officer has ever found the hidden compartment. So they feel confident. Or it's not my car. I, I don't know how they got there. So there's different rationales on why they give consent to, to search the vehicle. And, uh, and they, our officers are highly trained on how to get consent, make sure it's free and voluntary, or detect any indicators that may have probable cause to search the car immediately, detain the vehicle. Uh, the, uh, the sheriff said a lot of what I was thinking about saying, probably because he told me those things years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 like in the example that Freddie mentioned earlier, it's not just that they're stupid. You know, some of them are actually really smart people and, and professional people. And what causes them to commit traffic violations is that adrenaline dump that they get when they see the police. And the officer, ran, uh, the sheriff mentioned a minute ago, you know, you as a normal law-abiding citizen, when you see a cop sitting in the median or sitting, in, you come around the corner and you sit there, you get that adrenaline dump. And that's just because maybe you're going five miles an hour over the speed limit. But then, you know, like he said, imagine if you had drugs in the car too, enough drugs that can put you away for the rest of your life. How much more intense that adrenaline is, is going through. So what we see is when they notice us, or they notice that there's a cop following them or we're in the same lane or whatever, they get that adrenaline dump, they get and they start to have that fear reaction, and they'll do like Commander Bill Real mentioned go, they'll swerve over the right lane and tuck in behind the semi. Well for one, they do it suddenly and quickly because their adrenaline is pumping and they didn't properly signal their lane change. A lot of times they cause other vehicles around them to have to slam on the brakes or whatever. And then they'll get in behind a semi like you can't see them and they'll be a half a car length behind the semi. Well at 70 miles an hour you need to be about 70 feet behind that car. So their fear is what causes them to commit traffic violations. We're in the health business, but when it, I mean, you're not in the business of having opinions about policy. You do what your the law says that you're supposed to do. But wouldn't it be easier if we legalized a lot of these drugs? I mean, I'm not a fan of that. I worry about kids. I worry about you know the effects on society at large. But we spend a ton of time and spend a ton of money and we spend a ton of things that you guys do. On people who, you know, who got addicted because they had health issues, you know, they had orthopedic problems, and, 
and then they, they turn to what's illegal in order to continue right. that uh, because it's cheaper to get heroin. Uh, you know, would it be, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't expect you to answer the question. But I am, but, though, because that's a good question. I'm sure you, you have thought of it. Yes, that, and that's, that's a question that's always asked. That's always a touchy, uh, uh, you know, issue. Uh, as law enforcement officers, if it's illegal marijuana to, to possess here, it's illegal, period. There's no discussion about it. That's legislation, that's law, it's illegal. But it's just marijuana. But uh, other places, it's totally legal. This is Indiana, it's legal, so we enforce the laws. If it becomes uh, 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 legal, my opinion doesn't matter. I can't arrest you. If it becomes legal for medical use and you have a medical card, even I may be against it, it's irrelevant, it's legal, we enforce the law. Now, where do we draw the line of what we make legal or illegal? Uh, Colorado made uh, marijuana legal, okay? Taxes, you know, they tax it, they're making money. Look at the big picture, and this is just my observation, speaking with some uh, officers from Colorado, I, or, or, or people, I stopped a female from Colorado, going to Colorado, that had heroin uh, and meth inside of the vehicle. She was transporting it from Chicago to Colorado. And uh, I talked, hey, how about marijuana legal in your state? She says, you know, that just made lazy people lazier, in her view, and talked about why she was taking the heroin and the uh, meth to Colorado. So if you look at it that I'm a drug cartel from Mexico, let's just say, okay? And you're my connection in Colorado. And we're dumping a lot of marijuana there. I'm making good money. Now it's legal. Do I just give up on it? Do I give up on that business? No. I still have my connection in Colorado there. So I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to go with meth. You know, Mexican meth, uh, high quality stuff that are made in the mega labs down in Mexico. What I want you to do, I'm not going to lose money out of this. I'm not. I got my connections, I got my people, I got uh, the distribution points in Colorado. So I'm going to start pushing something else. So let's start a little bit, get it out there to the people for free, cheap. They get addicted, we start marketing that stuff, up the prices. And now they have a lot of overdose deaths, they have a lot of, uh, or ODs, and they have a lot of problems with, uh, with now they're having a, a meth and a heroin problem there. So look at the big picture. Who was bringing in that marijuana there, you know, and that organization that just lost money. And, and, business, and they're smart, they're business people. It's a multi-billion dollar business. What do you do? It's a smart businessman. Hey, if it's not Coca-Cola, start pushing Pepsi. You know, let's see what we can do. Or do something. We're not gonna lose that market, it's a lot of money. So, and that's what she was doing. That uh, she, they had to switch over, uh, that she was working for an organization to get that drug into Colorado. So you're, or this is the slippery slope argument that, uh, that eventually leads to you know, cultural breakdown because of, because of this, the system, I mean, mm -hmm. the fact is that people will find something to... Uh, to right, and, and the thing is, uh, it's an equal opportunity employer the drug business. It doesn't care if you're black, white, gay, uh, anything. As long as you get addicted and you buy the product and they make money off it, have at it. And, uh, you know, I know people that smoke marijuana when they were in college and school and, you know, or experimented. And they're successful business owners, you know, they look back at it, yeah, I, I tried it. Some people say it's a gateway drug. Well, maybe for some it was, you know. Uh, but it's not my position here to say legalize it or make it, you know, legal. I got my own personal views about it. But as a law enforcement officer, I'm here to enforce the laws as well as everybody else uh, with the Sheriff's Department of what's on the books. You know, we get people that drive through, hey, I'm from Colorado, I have, uh, you know, it's legal. It's not legal here. It's not legal here and you will go to jail, you know. Uh, the, the mentality that oh, marijuana is not a big deal anymore, well, think about it. Any student that may, may be smoking, that may have, uh, 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 you know, scholarships or something, and you think it's not a big deal, it is when you're arrested for amount, uh, uh, you know, a bag of marijuana, you think it's not a big deal, but guess what? In Indiana, it is, and you can lose a lot. From it. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
students here, are you in the, is it the criminal justice program? Yes, sir. Some of you are going to be in this, or all of you might be in this field in some way or some capacity, whether it's in the police department or probation or, or prosecutor's office or something like that. So it's all kind of ties in together. On, you know, the discussion really is all connected in one way or the other. So. Uh, we touched on the interview and the search. I'm not going to go too much on that because uh, the time in which we have other officers here. But we'll go straight to some of the techniques or some of the ways that they uh, transport uh, these drugs uh, that are coming through here in bulk. These are just a few things that uh, some slides that uh, put together uh, in compartments and where they're using vehicles to transport some of these drugs. Um, they, they do, you know, they're professionals in what they do and they do their best to make sure that uh, it, it, it gets from point A to point B. Uh, they want to they wanna hide their drugs inside the vehicles uh, so that law enforcement officers, canines, uh, don't, don't find it. Um, this, uh, what you see here is the, uh, on the top slide, it's just a quarter panel of a vehicle. Uh, that they modify, uh, that they modify, uh, they modify the quarter panel so that uh, so that it, it's, a, it's a hidden compartment. They they modified it with a, a trunk latch, so it's uh, they put their drugs in there. It's like a door, just like you you know, just like anything else, like a, a little door. You can't get to it. Uh, but we're trained. And, uh, to being able to see what's a factory car, how it's supposed to look, and realizing that they modified it and that there's something there. So uh, the bottom slide is the bottom right hand corner is a is a box that they built. Uh, if he keeps keeps messing it up, <laughs> it's a uh, they built a box underneath the floor. Sorry, Lord. So they built a box on the floor floor with a hydraulic arm. Uh, it's just a you know a little cubicle where you could fit you could fit a hundred thousand dollars in there. You could fit probably uh, ten kilos of cocaine or or five pounds of uh, heroin in there. So and uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, no police uh, just your general policeman's never going to even bother to look underneath there. We're able to look underneath the vehicle and be able to detect that they modified this car and we need to further investigate. So, um, go to the next slide. This is a slide that uh, Commander Stewart and I put together uh, a few years back of, uh, of a hidden compartment, and it gives you a better idea of, uh, of uh, some of the things you run, in, run into on the street. I don't know if there's volume to this. If not, uh, Commander Stewart will talk what what he's doing there. I, 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 
were able to, Mike and I were able to pinpoint that something was not right with this vehicle. And not just that, the interview, the interview told me that these guys are up to something and they have something hitting in this car. So we, we put a lot of effort on, on, on finding what exactly they were hiding and they had a whole false bottom of the car. That was, that's the door of the actual uh, compartment that we got open and that's what we got out of it. $265,000. So. <laughs> That's the uh, initial picture that you guys saw. Uh, with 540 pounds of marijuana. It says suicide load down there because there is no hidden compartment in a vehicle that you're going to be able to hide 500 pounds plus of marijuana. So they just throw it in there and they hope they don't get stopped by the police. <laughs> On that day he got stopped by me and when I talked to him he, as he said he had an adrenaline dump and he just could not, I mean how do you act, I mean he's sweating, he wants to, he actually asked me if he could have some of my water, <laughs> I let him have it, sure have some of my water and then he had some bogus story of exactly why he was in the Chicago land area coming to he was from Ohio and why he was in uh, in Chicago that day. So I just, it, you know, I'm not going to get into all the details because he could be here all day, but it didn't make sense. And that's because he had this in his, uh, his trunk or in the bed of the trunk. Here's another picture of uh, a stop with eight, about 80 pounds, 75 pounds of marijuana. That's a picture of us, uh, Commander Stewart and I. Side of the road. Here's a traffic stop by, at the time, Deputy Commander Oscar Martinez. Uh, that was in 2007. He had a hidden compartment in a bumper and uh, 22 kilos of cocaine. So that is a significant, that is, that is a very large seizure of cocaine. So that only gets pushed by major drug cartel organizations. And that got intercepted on that day by the sheriff on that day. He was able to find a hidden compartment on it and uh, 22 kilos. Sure. Uh, yeah, I was searching the vehicle and uh, it took quite some time. Uh, stories didn't match. Uh, third party vehicle uh, just out there on the side of the road. Now, you, you got to imagine that, you know, police work is dangerous, but when you're on the on the interstate in the middle of nowhere, you're by yourself. Uh, we always say don't search alone. But you got traffic to deal with too, semis just roaring by, and you're underneath the vehicle crawling, uh, pounding on you know the undercarriage of the vehicle because you think it may be a hidden compartment. And uh, it was it was uh, 2.2 million dollars worth of cocaine, and uh, that, that was and other larger seizures have been made by other officers. But that's what's out there. Well, we hold it as evidence. Uh, it's tested. It's taken to uh, if it goes federal to the DEA lab. If it's taken through state to the Indiana State Police, uh, it's photographed because a lot of them will have their their symbol on there, and it determines uh, what organization or cartel it came from. And at the end, when it's all said and done, it's destroyed. Uh, we'll have uh, go to believe it or not the steel mills and dump it into into the the molten glass the glass iron. Iron. Blast furnace, yeah, just burn weapons, narcotics, you know. So one thing about that stop that was interesting is that it was an elderly couple in their 60s, a man and a woman driving a minivan. Mm -hmm. You know, so they try to use your stereotypes against you. A lot of police are going to be stopping ghetto cars with spinners on and stuff like that. But you know, this was an elderly couple who said they would come back from visiting family. What about threats to you personally when you're the officer you're going to have to go to court yeah uh, that's that uh, that's happened uh, what they have is chase what it's called I'm sorry I should be standing what they have is uh, chase vehicles so that chase vehicle is there to protect that load there's been interviews done where you know that uh, one of the chase vehicles chickened out 
that uh, they know this area and the interdiction program that we have, that when the officer is on the side of the road, hopefully they can come back around, hit the officer, or side swipe the police car so we all focus on that vehicle and they'll be all right. Uh, I was told when I used to work a side job, you know, to watch out for that guy. He drives a silver, back then I had a silver uh, crown bed. He drives a silver uh, crown bed. His last name is Martinez. You get stopped by him. He's, you know, he's a narcotic guy. So then I have, at some point, I stopped wearing my nameplate. You know, I didn't wear anything, you know, I didn't want people to know who I was when I was making traffic stops. But uh, we're, I think uh, we're pretty much overall safe here. It's not like these other countries where they're killing officers like crazy, you know, but, uh, you know, you always have that in the back of your mind. Another traffic stop by uh, at the time. Uh, he was deputy commander at the time. He of cocaine on the side of I-65 back in 2006. This time he was the sergeant uh, with with uh, eight pounds of crystal meth. That's a large seizure to me. Um, Crystal meth is poison, and it's it's you know it falls into the category of all the, the heroin epidemic and the opioids and so forth. Crystal meth is uh, just as addictive to some of these people, and uh, like you mentioned earlier, it's what the market wants. And if the market wants, uh, if it's people are not buying uh, marijuana, or because it's not it's not making enough money on the street, there they'll put in a request for let's try this meth get the right connections and you get the right people to push that push that into your city and you get people hooked on it and there's a demand for it it's a money maker well that's the stuff that's getting uh, ultimately getting poured into the communities so it was intercepted on uh, back in 05 by uh, the sheriff another traffic stop this was a hundred and seventy five thousand dollars in cash Another traffic stop. It's fifteen thousand dollars to us. It's a small amount of money, <laughs> you know. But uh, fifteen thousand dollars is still fifteen thousand dollars. It's still drug money. And that it's like sitting on top of a cooler because it was hidden inside the lining of the cooler. So that's not normal. Uh, his, yeah, his interview led them to believe that they were hiding something. We searched the car all over. We couldn't find him. There's a cooler sitting there with nothing in it. So then we started messing around with the cooler. And sure enough, we pulled back the, uh, the lining of it. Well, there was U.S. currency. And this is the sheriff back in 1998. Uh, with over 200 pounds of marijuana inside. How old were you, some of you guys uh, up there in 98? Uh, <laughs> one? One. one. <laughs> one. <laughs> so there was, and I don't want to, I'm not getting into it, but uh, the sheriff has made more than two, two seizures in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it at that. So he's made a lot of seizures. He's trained us directly. This is just some of the things that we've been running into in uh, in 2018. We're in March, or we're in uh, April. Uh, 5,000 pills of ecstasy, $10,000 in cash. Uh, the top right is uh, what's the big uh, problem right now, everywhere nationwide, it's a kilo of heroin. One kilo of heroin is a, is a significant amount of uh, Heroin. So that can supply a whole city for weeks on out. So we uh, that was hidden inside a air filter in a SUV vehicle. The uh, one of my, my detectives made a traffic stop. They knew that uh, something was not right. And they searched the vehicle and they popped they popped the hood of the vehicle. Most officers will not, you'll never see an officer pop the hood of a vehicle unless it's us uh, on the side of the road. We popped it and the filter was. Uh, the filter was in the back seat of the car, so it led the detective. Well, let me go and look and see why the you know, why there's a filter sitting in the rear seat of the car when he popped the hood and opened up where the filter would normally be. Well, there's a, uh, a brick-like package sitting in there. Kilo of cocaine is 2.2 pounds. 
what are you charging with when they have cash? Well, so one of the things that we do that when, okay, so if you have uh, over $100,000 and you have it hidden in a hidden compartment, you're not going to claim that money. So a lot of the times we're seizing that money because nobody's claiming it. Uh, number two, uh, based on our training and experience, uh, if it's hidden in a hidden compartment or concealed in some way, uh, based on the interview, investigation, uh, and we have enough probable cause to believe that it's drug proceeds. Uh, number three, we call the IRS as well. You know, you have over ten thousand dollars, and if you're claiming that money, which a lot, a lot of individuals don't, in the drug business, they they anticipate loss. You know, the cost of doing business, uh, and uh, they're willing to give up a couple hundred thousand dollars, so there's no uh, uh, to avoid attention or, or investigation uh, towards an organization. So just let this. You know, if a um, hundred. Uh, uh, trucks went by with uh, drugs and 80% of them get stopped, that 20% is still making them a lot of money. We just keep going. You know, so, so they say it's not mine, they don't know how it got there, mm -hmm. and then it's yours. Then it's but, we, but, we, but we do, it's uh, uh, our attorney, or seizure attorneys, uh, take it to court. We have to publicize that in the paper. Hey, there's uh, $250,000 out here, anybody? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> And then after it's publicized, after a certain amount of time, uh, the the uh, paperwork is done uh, to go to court. So then it's go it goes to court with our attorney, asking that this uh, money be seized uh, to law enforcement, which is used for training and equipment by law. And they're at their table, and the judge looks at the other side of the table, and it's empty. Nobody's there. The money's yours. Go ahead. Running a little bit yeah. here. Our presentation always people ask questions and it, it you know we end up talking and talking. I hope it happens all the time. So that's what I told him. I said we're, we're going to need a lot more than 20 minutes because it's just naturally going to happen. These are just a few other things: uh, money, drugs. There's that air filter that I was telling you about in that top right hand corner. That's the air filter box of the vehicle. <coughs> And that's just some of the officers and some of the things that are just some more trophy shots. And then I took this off the uh, Times Magazine because, uh, you know, we're, as, as the commanding officer of the Lake County Drug Task Force and the units that we have, the high crime units that are every day working the streets, taking down some of these uh, violent offenders, taking, I don't know how many guns we've taken off the street. Just yesterday we took two guns off a guy that was hiding two guns underneath the seat. One was tucked behind the back seat and the other one was hidden somewhere else. So we're taking all these violent offenders and, and, and people that are, you know, that are committing criminal activity. The units that are on the highway, that well, you know, they're working their, you know, they're working their butt off on the highway. The guys that are working the streets in the cities and then our undercover officers that are working with informants, buying drugs, uh, dealing with, uh, with, with drug dealers. That's all fine and dandy from the law enforcement perspective. But I took this off the Times Magazine because this makes a lot of sense. Uh, I got in a car accident and was in the hospital for three to four months. At first I took it for pain, it's prescribed as needed. I started to like the buzz, so I began talking, or I began taking more than I was supposed to. Then a family member introduced me to heroin. I actually cried at first because I didn't feel any more pain. All it takes is more time. We're fighting the war on drugs from the interstates, the streets, and from underco undercover uh, capabilities. But that's the main problem right now is the, uh, the epidemic of people being addicted to opioids and heroin. And so, uh, my office is trying to, uh, you know, one of the things that I, that we're focusing on is specifically going after those heroin dealers. Um, yeah, we can seize all this money and so forth, but we're trying to get those drug dealers on the street. That's the number one thing that my office is trying to do. Uh, some of the grants and some of the funding that I'm getting uh, to run the office, I'm setting a certain amount of money aside specifically for opioids and heroin. 
so that I don't run out of money to, number one, pay officers overtime to attack heroin opioids, and then number two, to do any type of undercover uh, uh, purchases or transactions to take those, uh, those dealers off the street. Um, and I have some other stats on opioids and so forth, but I can keep going. So. Yeah, so, because uh, we got to get moving. Uh, you can talk to Commander Villarreal uh, after this. What we'll do is go on to uh, Special Operations <coughs> and, uh, and the Aviation Unit and Animal Control. Were you going to speak? Yes, and Animal Control. Wow. And then uh, once we're done from here, I don't know if uh, somebody, you could decide if they wanted to go to lunch first, or they can go out and tour the, the helicopter, our command center, our canine unit, and uh, also so uh, move towards a jail tour, okay? I have a, a question for each of you before we switch over, and that is, what motivated you all to get into law enforcement? Everyone has a story. Yeah, um, well, uh, for me, uh, uh, I had a, my parents, you know, they own a business, and uh, I got into the family business, like, they think child labor <laughs> since I was small uh, working there. Uh, my uh, my brothers and sisters went into the family business. I was like the black sheep. I remember uh, traveling, uh, uh, taking trips to Mexico uh, to visit family, and we we always drove. And uh, looking outside the window at the state troopers on the highway, uh, going through checkpoints in Texas, you see a lot of traffic stops where they're finding drugs, and uh, that's what I wanted to be. I said, you know, I want to, I want to be a highway, you know, patrol officer. So I applied for the Indiana State Police and County. Uh, so the. For me, it was, uh, you know, to go out, it sounds corny, but I wanted to be a part of making a difference and, you know, making our area better. And my passion was in narcotics. And, uh, you know, that's what I got into, uh, undercover narcotics, work with DEA. And then the interstate, I wanted to get out there and start seizing a large amount of drugs and see what we can get. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Dan Merchuk. I've been for about 23 years. I only have about an hour and a half of material, I'm sorry, I'm like a little longer. I'm just kidding. I'm going to make this pretty quick. So I'm the uh, Deputy Commander of Special Operations, which is Marine Aviation. I'm also assigned to the Patrol Division and any other special projects that uh, come my way. I'm just specifically going to talk about the uh, Lake County Marine Unit today. So. Uh, we all know Lake, Mission's a, uh, Lake Michigan is a big lake. It's about 300 miles long. It's about you know, the widest part of over 100 miles. And you know, we have a huge portion of Lake Michigan that comes into Indiana. Uh, the state line actually goes out all the way off of 79th Street in Chicago. It's actually the waters in Indiana. So when you get off the beaches in Chicago, you don't have to go but 100 yards and you're, you're in Indiana waters. Uh, and it goes out about eight miles in the lake, and there's some, some lines out there that uh, draw that up. You know, the lake's 22,000 square miles. It's essentially an ocean that can have up to 20 or 30 foot waves at times. It's a very dangerous lake. Uh, and where we sit, because of the north-south flow of the currents, they come right down to Lake Michigan, and all that water comes in, it creates a lot of problems for us, a lot of undertows, a lot of rip currents. We see a lot of people drown every year in Lake Michigan because they don't understand how dangerous the lake can be. Uh, so we're, we're always constantly out there um, you know, doing things like that. So the unit was started in the, the early 90s. Uh, there was a need to have uh, some enforcement out there. Um, so we, we, we have a marine unit station. It's at the Patrick Marina in East Chicago, Indiana. Uh, it looks like a little house. It's essentially a little fire station. So beginning here at the end of the month, all the way up into Oct in October, our officers switched to a 40, uh, 24 on and 48 off like a fireman schedule. The officers that are assigned. We have uh, a captain that runs the unit along with uh, six officers, and they, they work they work a fireman's shift essentially. They get there early in the morning, and, and they can go home about midnight, uh, or they they have the choice to stay there on call. But if there's if it's a warm night and things are going, then they'll, they'll stay there, you know, until the next crew relieves them in there. Uh, we have four shifts four vessels. Uh, two of our main ships that we use constantly, we have a 30, uh, 36 foot, it's called the Silver Ship uh, Pilot House Boat. Uh, we purchased that in 1995. We've upgraded it with a grant and redid the engines on it. It's very expensive. Boats are very expensive. They're not cheap. They cost thousands and thousands of dollars and it 
costs thousands and thousands of dollars to repair. So we have two of those. The main one we use, or two main ones we use, is the one I just told you about when we did the engines. That boat's capable of going up to 12, 10 to 12 foot seas. And believe me, people go on Lake Michigan when they should never go on Lake Michigan. Uh, the other boat we got, a newer boat, was a, uh, uh, is from 2013, and we got that with a grant from Homeland Security. Um, that has two twin engines. That boat has a top speed of 52 miles an hour. The other one has a top speed of about 36 miles an hour. The other boats, we have an old Boston whaler. Uh, it needs some engine repair on it. Uh, it has two engines. One's working. We're in the process of getting another one repaired. We have a smaller orange boat, uh, and the, the engines are in the process of getting fixed on that. We also have a couple of wave runners that do that. Uh, so our, our primary mission out on Lake Michigan uh, is, is to enforce uh, safety regulations, make sure people are boating safety, and search and rescue. We do quite a bit of that. Um, you know, we patrol the waters, uh, and we do go into the <coughs> Illinois waters because they ask for mutual aid and assistance, and I'll explain that a little bit further in a minute. But we enforce marine, you know, marine reinforcement, no different like you get a DUI in a car, we'll give you a DUI in a boat. Um, same, same rules, same laws apply for that. And people think, well, I'm on the boat, I'm having a good time, I'm having a few beers, you know, it's the summertime, you know, it's 80 degrees, 90 degrees, they're in their boat driving around. A boat's a big responsibility to drive. The boat don't stop like a car. So we have a lot of boating accidents, and a lot of that is tied to people with alcohol and sometimes drugs. Uh, occasionally we find people transporting drugs on, on our, our boats out there. Um, you know, they'll take it from Chicago across to Michigan City, or they'll take it across to Michigan. So we have found quantities of narcotics on the boats. Um, you know, Lake Michigan has a lot of vessels out there. There's a lot of harbors and marines around here. So there's a lot of traffic and it's beginning to pick up this time of year. I know we didn't have much of a spring, but it's, it's coming. So the responsibilities out there, we do safety checks, we do boating checks. We can pull up and ask to do a safety check. That's in compliance with uh, rules and regulations with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, we work in conjunction with the United States Coast Guard. There's a uh, station in Cal, they call it Cal Harbor in the south side of Chicago. And there's also one in Michigan City. Um, the Coast Guard is very busy and they have limited resources uh, like anybody else. So that's one of the big needs that we got a marine unit going on the lake out there. Uh, so they stay very busy. You also have the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, DNR officers. They also come out on, on Lake Michigan. But there's only three or four of them assigned in Lake County. There's only four or five of them in Port County and Laporte County. Lake Michigan's a huge lake, so you, when, you, when you only have three or four boats out there operating for you know search and rescue, uh, that's very difficult. We're very fortunate that, and you guys have seen a little bit, we have our aviation unit. Uh, they play a big role in our search and rescue on Lake Michigan. They can see a lot of things up there that you just can't see on the boat from the water because of the waves or the horizon or a lot of other things. And they have the capability to go out there. We normally patrol the wall anywhere from 8 to 10 miles, is normally is about as far as we want to go. We have gone out as far as 20, 25 miles uh, when, we, when we know there's a rescue that needs to be made out there. We're the closest uh, you know, uh, vessel to, to do that, to go on and make a saber search. Uh, we also work with the uh, uh, Department of Natural Resources on a regular basis to do enforcement and try to do training. Uh, Homeland Security has played a big role in what we do now. We are tapped with industry on Lake Michigan. We have BP, we have the steel mills, we have the ship canals, we have all that. So some of our duties and responsibilities, uh, part of the deal of getting the, one of the grants we got from Homeland Security, is to patrol those uh, waterways, looking for suspicious activity, making sure nobody's trying to mess with the infrastructure, our water intake systems, all that kind of stuff that's very important that keeps us running every day. So they have a lot of responsibility to do that and they make those patrols. Uh, you know, we, we work out there with the, it's called the uh, Northwest Indiana uh, Law Enforcement Strike Team. It's, it's comprised of five counties. We work in conjunction with them. We train with, with our officers out there. We actually have our, our SWAT team and our district uh, strike law enforcement team train boarding boats, different things like that, just like you see the Coast Guard uh, does like that. So we're always busy and there's always a lot of things going out there. And what we find all the time is people go on Lake Michigan. They just, they don't understand the lake can change in a minute. A wind direction, a thunderstorm, you know, it looks calm out here and they get out a mile, two, three miles, and it's not what they think it is. Their boat's not made to be on a lake like that. And I'll talk about that in, in a minute. You know, we've had 
uh, been really lucky. You know, in the last few years, um, we've had some officers make some rescues just in the harbor. Uh, Lake Michigan water is like 40 degrees right now. You're not going to last the 40 degree of water very long at all. Even when it's 60 degrees, when it warms up in the low 60s, you'll last longer, but you won't last forever, man, because it will bring your body core temperature down, and you, you, know, you know things start changing. Um, our officers have been lucky to be, you know, kind of Johnny on the spot at the right time. Somebody fell at the marina off their sailboat at the beginning of the season, and they were a little older. They couldn't get up. They were clinging, you know, to a rope until one of our officers looked out and saw that they were able to pull that gentleman to safety. Uh, we had a couple incidents last year where people pulled out watercrafts, you know, on their jet skis. They think they're going to go out there on that lake, and they get out there, the jet ski breaks, it flips over. They're clinging on a little uh, jet ski out there. Our officers happened to see that, and we were able to pull some, some rescues. We've had other rescues where people have called their boats have capsized, and we've gone out there and rescued people, uh, you know, clinging on at the last minute. We also will get a lot of calls of boats in distress, their engines go out. You know, you're at the mercy of the wind and the currents. The boat's going towards the uh, the rocks or something like that. It doesn't take much. We will go out there and we will tell them in for safety reasons if we have to do that. It's very important what we do out there. A lot of people don't understand we do. The jurisdiction of the water actually falls on the county sheriff's department as soon as you put your toe in the water. So all the communities that go up where, where the water starts, they really don't have a responsibility where the sheriff's department has responsibility and jurisdiction along with the Coast Guard and, and the DNR out there. Um, we work hand in hand with these other agencies, but they, you know, you can imagine on the weekends when it's warm out, how many boats and jet skis are on Lake Michigan. We go everywhere. So if Chicago has a marine unit, but if Chicago has a search and rescue going, it's close to our jurisdiction, we will go help them. Uh, we go on the Lake and Porter, uh, Lake, uh, Porter County and Laporte County all the time. They don't have the resources we have. We have mutual aid agreements. Uh, sheriff's very big about us, making sure we're out there and assisting those agencies and being part of that. Those are just a few of the things we do. Um, I don't want to take up too much more time because I know that we're running a little bit long, but I'd be glad to take any questions from you guys or anything. Um, if you don't have any, uh, yeah, the aviation, what's uh, Randy? Or somebody there can speak about the aviation. <laughs> This is another one interesting. Thank you very much. Not to say that uh, that's really I, I really enjoyed it. And some people really have to have a heart for this. One of them, so I think I worked on trying to get the helicopter. The first one you guys looked through. But is that I think uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation. And if all of you want to stand up and take a little break, uh, relax, and please do so. The ladies' washroom is we go around. The corner go up front and they go around and there's a the ladies washroom, the men's washroom, you have to go down the hall and then uh, all the way to the end and they hang a right and then you, get, you can see the men's washroom. That's the only way I can uh, phrase it. So if you want to just for a few minutes until we get ready back in here and everyone and I put the PowerPoint presentation. Oh, uh, we can stand so up and applaud. Oh, there's here. There I'll set it up and go ahead, uh, please go ahead and take a break right now for a minute, just so I can set up this stuff. Lieutenant Randy Phillips, uh, he's uh, in charge of our aviation unit. Good morning, everybody. Good yeah. morning. Good morning. Uh, I don't know. To try to make this quick, it was called 15 minutes. I could sit up here and talk to you all day long about our unit, what we do, and everything. But again, my name is Randy Phillips, I'm a lieutenant with the aviation unit. Uh, the unit started in 1979. We've been around 39 years. Uh, right now we cover all of Lake County. Okay. The three aircraft here, the three main aircraft that we have. Uh, the one to the left is a, uh, we took uh, possession of in 2009 is a uh, American Eurocopter EC-120. Nickname for that is a hummingbird, probably because it is fast, agile, and that is the widest helicopter on the market. Uh, the one all the way to the right, uh, the hummingbird, the 120, is our everyday ship we use for patrol searches. Uh, I get more into it on one of the other slides. Uh, the one all the way to the right is a military surplus, 1971 OH-58 Kiowa. Uh, that one we use as a backup ship. 
Uh, we used to use it for patrol and searches all the time until we took possession of the uh, 120. As our backup ship, our training aircraft that we use for uh, incoming pilots. The one in the middle, uh, military surplus, 1965 UH-1H Iroquois, or nickname for that is a Huey helicopter. Many of you have seen any of the Vietnam movies, We Were Soldiers. Uh, that was the uh, troop uh, transport aircraft. Uh, that is like a pickup truck for us. Uh, we use it for all of our special operations. Uh, getting a little bit more on that on one of the other slides. But those are the uh, three aircraft that we currently use. Uh, we cover the entire county, which is a little about 600 square miles, plus the uh, lakeshore. The pilots we have on staff, the crew I should say, uh, myself, I have 29 years on the uh, police department here. 18 years of it flying. Uh, Officer Eichelberger, over here to the right. Uh, Dave had about 17 years on Hobart. 10, 11 years on the county now. 13 Hobart, 12 here. And 10 years flying? 10 years flying. We are the two full-time pilots. We're here every day. Uh, the unit covers 24-7, 365 days a, a year. The only thing that stops us from a call basically is the weather. We have certain weather minimums uh, we stick to because uh, anything past that can get a little dangerous. Uh, the next two pilots are part-time pilots. Our chief flight instructor, uh, Olaf Tzerzer. Uh, he has, he's flown every type of aircraft you can imagine. He had 18 years in the military. He was a Huey pilot, test pilot, instructor. He knows that aircraft inside and out. Uh, the next pilot, uh, Nathan Schrock, was a Maryville police officer. I believe he had about 11, 11 12 years on Maryville PD. Uh, became a hel uh, helicopter pilot, an uh, instructor. He's going to different schools to instruct. Uh, he left Maryville PD. He uh, flies. He does um, ag flying with a helicopter now works for a couple other people flying and instructing their aircraft. Uh, we do have a newer pilot, uh, Jesse Vargas. Uh, Jesse's on our department, he's full time. He is just starting to go through a pilot school. Uh, just to give you an idea, to start to get your basic rotor license, once you obtain that, could be six to nine months. After that, you put in so many uh, hours in the OH-58, you'll transition to that. Then you move up to the uh, EC-120 and then up to the Huey. So to become a PIC or what we call pilot in command of uh, 58 and the 120 will take you two to three years uh, time frame. Uh, the other two officers uh, are TFOs or what we call a tactical flight officer. They sit in the left seat, they operate all the equipment. Uh, Corporal Barry Clint we have here is a 19, 20 year, 21, 21 year veteran with Maryville PD. He has been with our unit before I came here as we used to call an observer. Uh, would fly in the left seat and work the equipment and look out for the bad guys. Um, TFO Jamie uh, Hicks, Deputy Hicks. Um, now Jamie has, was in the Army and the Guard as a crew chief and a mechanic. Uh, he's worked for several heavy lift companies as a crew chief mechanic. Uh, he's come to our department. Uh, he first came as a mechanic, one of our two contract mechanics. Outstanding individual. Uh, he is a TFO also. Both uh, Corporal Clanton and Jamie Hicks being TFOs with our instructors now are going through the steps to become pilots. So we give them stick time when we're up flying. The instructor gives them more <coughs> stick time. Uh, they're actually in the next month or two getting ready to take their written test to continue on. It's a long process. Uh, they donate a lot of their time to us. Aerial services provided. When we go fly, we cover the entire county. Our main purpose is to the citizens of Lake County, 
is all the patrol officers on our ground. That is our number one priority. When we fly, we listen to all 18 municipalities in the county. If we're flying, officers on a traffic stop, we will circle that officer until he gives us a thumbs up or we call him on the radio, make sure everything's good. Uh, we also do a lot of pursuits, whether it's a vehicle pursuit or a car pursuit. 18 years I've been here, as far as I know, anytime we come on scene and it's an active foot pursuit or car pursuit, we have never lost the suspect. We always take them into custody. Um, last month and a half, we've had two good pursuits. One lasted an hour, 45 minutes. Started in the county, went up to near Midway Airport, took that subject into custody. Another pursuit went up to Calumet City, Evidently, he didn't know we were a problem. When we're doing a pursuit with the ground units, that lets the ground units back off. It makes it safer for the officers, makes it safer for all the other uh, civilians on the road. Uh, the gentleman pulled off into a gas station. We were able to relay that to the ground units that were still in the area. In about two minutes, while the gentleman was sitting in his truck chilling, the officers pulled up, took him into custody. Uh, we do a little bit of everything, um, searches, well, I'll give you a, a quick thing, mutual aid to other counties. Uh, we do service Newton Jasper County down to the south of us, Porter, LaPorte, Stark County out to the east in Indiana, uh, Illinois, we have gone into Cook, Will, Kent Key counties. When I say mutual aid, it's not an everyday deal. It's either a pursuit, home invasion, uh, missing person, missing child, drowning victim, something substantial. The sheriff gives us a lot of latitude on that to help other agencies. It works out very well for us. Federal agencies that we have helped, and I do, I forgot to uh, put ATF on there. We work with FBI, EDA, ATF, U.S. Marshal Service, those are usually for surveillance, photos. They want to follow someone around, we'll do that. They need to take photos, aerial photos of certain areas. Uh, we will do that. Secret Service, uh, a few years back when uh, Vice President Biden was in office, uh, he was up in this area on three separate occasions. So we worked with the Secret Service, did all their aerial surveillance and uh, security. That was rather interesting, something else for us to learn. A uh, very good time. U.S. Coast Guard National Park Service. Usually the Coast Guard will call us out for a boater in distress, drowning victim. Uh, National Park Service will also do for drowning victims. Unfortunately, again, as Commander Murchek said, if you're from this area on the lake, anytime the winds come off the north end of the lake, creates a lot of rip currents. They put the flags out, the lifeguards will tell you no swimming. 99% of the people are not from this area. Disregard it, go down where there's no lifeguard, we'll go in, get caught in a rip current, end up drowning. They'll have us come out on the first day, we'll set time, if it's churning out there, we will not find them. We will continue to go out on a daily basis, sometimes twice a day. While we're up in the aircraft, if it's within a day or two, more than likely they're going to be laying on the bottom. Uh, on the bottom, we'll find them from a certain height, angle, we can see them laying on the bottom. Or after three, four, five days, depending on water temperature, they'll float up. We'll find them either in that area or somewhere else on the lake. Uh, we'll notify either our marine, marine unit or Porter County. Uh, they'll come uh, pick them up. Uh, Project Lifesaver we work with. This is Crown Point Fire is the big uh, unit. Uh, Sherville Fire also helps them. Uh, what this is, is if you have a family member, grandma, grandpa, whoever, autistic, dementia, or Alzheimer's, they tend to walk away. You're watching them. You go take a shower, come out 20 minutes later, they're gone. They have a wrist bracelet that they put on them. The 
it's a radio frequency, pretty much like a tracker, they can't get it off. So if they're gone, you call them up, you say, this is my grandpa's name, they look, find the frequency, they can come out, they have a tracking device that they can use on the ground. It's good for line of sight so many feet. About three and a half years ago, we talked to them. Out west, they use this, the fire department and police department work together. Put them in the helicopter, we take them up five, six hundred feet. Now this opens an area up to three to four miles. We train with them, uh, they pick up the tone, we do a certain pattern till they pick up a tone. Once they do the tone, we fly a different pattern. pattern. Uh, depending on the operator, they can bring it down to a one to two block area. Some people can tell you they're in this building. Uh, we've been doing this three and a half years. To date, every time we've been called out, from the last point of contact, we've found the person in 15 minutes or less. Very good uh, item to have. Unfortunately, we've gone up some that weren't on the tracker, and unfortunately, we found them deceased in other areas. Indiana Department of Homeland Security, District 1 Task Force. Again, Commander uh, Merchek touched on that. That is a culmination of police, fire, EMS uh, in five districts, pretty much uh, Lake, Newton, Jasper, Porter, and Fort Counties. Um, we do stuff for them for terrorism and or uh, natural disasters. With the aircraft we have, uh, there's only two law enforcement aircraft units in the entire state, us and the state police. Uh, we are the only one that has a mixture of aircraft, uh, especially the Huey for everything we can do with it. Uh, makes us sort of a uh, premier uh, law enforcement agency for the state. Uh, this is the EC-120, which is parked outside. If you get a chance, come look at it. I love this one picture. Not too many agencies can say you parked next to Air Force Two. Uh, 2009, uh, the picture on the left is the cockpit. It gives you a general idea. It's basically from the left side or the tactical flight officer side. When you're sitting in that seat, you're really, really working. The uh, big screen to the left is our moving map system. It's like a GPS on steroids. It gives us all the streets for Indiana, Illinois. We can pull up airports, all kind of information on it. Uh, we work with fire departments. If they have a large field fire, uh, we can do what's called a, a fire track. Go all the way around, it'll tell us how many acres the fire burned for their reports. Uh, we can switch it over. The controller down here is for our FLIR system. You really can't see it too good. The little ball on the front of the 120 is a daytime camera. And then we can switch it over to a FLIR forward looking infrared or a thermal imager so we can see everybody at night. It uh, works during the day. Any chases, foot pursuits again, we've had day or night, once we lock on to them, we have not lost them. A lot of times between the uh, FLIR and how quiet that aircraft is, they have no idea we're even around looking at them. Uh, on the uh, light pad is a mini iPad, which uh, we have what's called fourth flight on there. Gives us a lot of information as far as weather, other aircraft in the area, airports, airspaces we come in and out of. Uh, Gary Airport is what we call a Class D airport, so we actually have to ask permission to come into the airspace because of 737s, heavier aircraft that come in and out of there. Uh, the OH-58. Again, military, it's just your basic bare bones aircraft. Uh, the only equipment we have on there is a searchlight. Uh, again, we used to use this as our everyday uh, aircraft, so if we go into other counties to help them, we would go by either roads or certain uh, landmarks to get uh, to them. With the 120 now, we can put in a street address, mile marker, intersection, 
latitude, longitude, take us right there. Uh, it is our backup ship and our training ship now for new coming, uh, new incoming pilots. The UH-1 Huey helicopter, like I said, that is a pickup truck. It has a multi-mission uh, platform. We use it for all of our special operations. The top left picture is a picture of the Huey at uh, uh, Gary Methodist Hospital. They are a trauma center. Uh, last year, all of you know, uh, the Radisson Hotel, they tore it down. We were actually invited by the U.S. Army. They had four uh, units of their natural disaster search team, uh, one unit from the Marine Corps and the um, Israeli Army. Uh, once a year for the last eight years, the U.S. Army and Israelis get together. One year is the United States, one year is uh, Israel. Uh, they do training exercises to look for uh, disaster people. They use the hotel and they never had anything that big. Used us as a um, medevac unit. So as they went through uh, with the army personnel, they'd find them in different, uh, in different uh, casualty ratings. Uh, we would either load them up on a helicopter in uh, uh, skids, or you could take one in a, in a skid, uh, two or three people, what they call walking wounded, uh, fly them up to the trauma center. Trauma center went through their uh, procedures. So we probably did 14 lifts on that. Uh, the bottom picture, uh, we use it for our tactical teams. We train with them on a daily basis, both, or uh, yearly basis, uh, both our tactical team and the district. We can load up uh, eight tactical officers, fully geared up in there, uh, drop them wherever they need to be. Uh, within this year, we're going to look at other ways of uh, uh, dropping them as far as what we call a fast rope system. Uh, the one up to the left, or to the right, upper right, is uh, some training that we did on Lake Michigan. We can actually deploy divers. U.S. Coast Guard has rescue swimmers. We actually can deploy fully uh, geared up divers. Uh, we can do divers, we can do, again, SWAT team, our canines, all of our canines and the handlers are all airborne certified. All the dogs actually like to fly. Uh, the bottom right is what we call a bandy bucket or an aerial water drop system. Uh, we actually got this bucket uh, through a grant through Arcelor Middle. Uh, that bucket holds 210 gallons of water, about 18 and a half thousand eight hundred and fifty pounds. If you have a big field fire, uh, we trained with it last spring and we used it twice in October, big bog fire up in the north section of the county, Calumet Township, the one down south between uh, Sherville and St. John that was a cornfield fire that was moving toward a neighborhood. Uh, fire department out there tried to put it out with their brush trucks. Unfortunately, one of their trucks got burned up, asked us to come out. Uh, we can hook it up. We take it over to a water source if we can find a pond that's at least four feet deep. Uh, we bring the bucket down, hits the water, turns over on side, fills up with water. We can lift it up, take it over. We have one of our TFO's crew chiefs in the back. They will lay in the back of the uh, Huey. I can't really see them, the door's open. We get them on, tra on track for the uh, line of the fire. And they give us all the commands after that. Tell us to come left, come right. They get over it. They hit a button, dumps the water. Uh, both of the fires, we picked up four loads, put four loads on the fire, put the fire out. Very good uh, tool, as I use it, uh, for us, for the unit. Uh, again, I could sit here all day and tell you where how we started, where we're at, what we're looking to go, we keep growing. Uh, the sheriff gives us a lot of uh, uh, pats on the back, gives us a lot of le uh, leeway, a lot of uh, help on it, so we're truly appreciative of that. This is a quick uh, two-minute video. Uh, we start using uh, 
uh, GoPros now and just do some training. Uh, we're doing some training in the Huey. Uh, what we call, I wish it had some sound because that's got some awesome music to it. Um, but we're doing what's called auto rotation, which we practice on a daily basis. In case we lose an engine, we actually roll the power of the engine off. It disengages the main rotor system and just freewheels. It's a way for us to land, but we add power toward the end and uh, come back. So the panel there, this is we're rolling the power off. This is a, what we call the 180. We can do a straight in or a left or a right turn. This gives you an idea how quick you're coming down that helicopter once the, uh, the power is turned off. I had my choice of losing the, the engine in an airplane or a helicopter. I'm going to take the helicopter. Going down once in a plane, once in a helicopter, the helicopter works out a whole lot better. Uh, we keep all of our aircraft at Griffith Airport. We have these three here. Uh, the last two years, we've picked up another Huey from the military and another OH-58 Jet Ranger. Uh, this we're practicing is what we call a uh, pinnacle landing. Nice size hill, just enough for the skids to land on. Uh, we start practicing this with the pilots. Then we can use our canine or tactical officers in different scenarios to do this. Uh, once we get back, you'll be able to see uh, Griffith Airport. And when we come back, what makes us a little different too, most departments, when they go back to their bases, they land on the ground. We land all the aircraft on what we call a dolly or a platform. So that takes a little bit more uh, finesse Sometimes you can do it the first time, sometimes it may take you two or three times. Um, that's all I have. I tried to compress it down as much as I can because I'd stay here all day and tell you about each aircraft. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, please come out, look at, we have the EC-120 and the Huey out there. Uh, we have the baby bucket out there and uh, the hoist and some other equipment we uh, use on uh, the Huey. You can see the inside of the uh, 120. If you have any questions, feel free. Uh, any of us, I answer questions for you. Uh, thank you for your time and your patience with me. I really appreciate it. We'll finish off here with uh, animal control, and then what we can do is go right outside. Uh, we could go out, out the front doors here, and it's on the, to the right hand side. Please. Uh, Go over there, we have the command center, the helicopters, uh, canine out there as well. So uh, as soon as we're done here, we'll go out there. And then from there, we'll decide, uh, uh, Mr. Gomez Stamos will uh, decide, uh, you know, who's, who all wants to do the jail tour, right?
Um, as you heard the sheriff say, our jurisdiction is all areas of unincorporated Lake County. We will also impound um, for some other local municipalities if we have space when it permits. Um, and sometimes we'll help out other animal controls in the area as well. Um, we are a no-kill facility, so we do not euthanize based off of breed or um, if we need cage space. Our live release rate, it, to be considered no-kill, you have to have a live release rate of 92%. Ours is 94.5 of 2017. Um, our cat life release rate for 2017 was 96% and for an animal control facility that's um, unheard of so we're really proud of that. Our mission is to provide refuge and promote the ethical treatment of animals in a healthy, safe, and clean environment. We strive to educate the public with the same tenacity and compassion as we use to our shelter our animals. And we believe that every cat and dog deserves a fair chance of finding a loving home no matter what age, breed, or how long they've been at our shelter. Um, we impound all strays from an unincorporated county. We also will impound law enforcement seizures. Uh, so if somebody is, that could be a variety of things. If there's a uh, search warrant and there's an animal in the house, um, when the officers are executing that warrant, we'll get called up to take the animal. If somebody's being arrested and for whatever reason they have an animal with them, we take the animal. Um, there's been times where we've assisted uh, in field calls and complaints regarding animal abuse, and in those situations, sometimes the animals get confiscated, they come to us. Um, we also provide shelter and care for those animals, so once they have been impounded, now it's up to us to continue to make sure that they are taken care of. Um, and then we also, as long as the animals are in our custody legally, to place those animals in either a home or a rescue, or um, sometimes back to the field if they're wild cats. So we'll start our day with passing out medications to the animals, uh, we clean and feed everybody. We also want to make sure that all the animals are getting enrichment um, because they are caged and animals for the most part are meant to be caged. So we try to make it a little bit less like doggy jail than it is. Um, impound any new animals, make sure animals are getting out frequently. Um, we also, aside from taking care of all of the cleaning and the feeding, it's up to us to provide the medical care for our animals. And, our entire staff is only made up of eight people, including myself. So we clean, we feed, we provide enrichment, get their dogs out, provide new impound exams, um, and facilitate the outcomes, as well as do vaccines, in-house blood testing, um, and veterinary transports. Um, we also do our general cleaning as well, of course. Every animal in our facility, they're a dog, they get spayed or neutered, they get an in-house heartworm test where we draw the blood ourselves, test the animal, uh, they get a rabies vaccine, distemper vaccine, bordetella, and both canine and influenza shots. Uh, this is to ensure that we don't have a uh, disease outbreak. We have had an instance of a canine flu outbreak about a year and a half ago. Um, we don't we want to make sure that doesn't happen again. Our cats all get spayed and neutered, they get their blood drawn in-house again and get combo tested for FIV and FVLV. Um, they get a rabies vaccine and a nurse and PC vaccine that also ensures that there's no disease outbreak within the facility. Um, we do have several programs we rely heavily on to operate. We have a volunteer program. You have to be 21 and up and you can come and do um, pretty much anything you want. <laughs> we'll take any help where we can get it. Um, a lot of our volunteers will walk dogs. They'll help us wash dishes. They'll help us clean in the kennel. We have a foster program. You also have to be 21 and up where you can take home animals and care for them. Um, we rely on our fosters to take care of orphan puppies and kittens. Mostly we also have hospice fosters. Uh, we do get quite a few senior dogs that will get dumped in rural parts of the county and we try not to make them spend all their last days in the shelter. We utilize the Sheriff's Work Release Program. So we have female trustees from the jail that come over Monday through Friday in the mornings. They help us clean in the kennels and they uh, get to spend time out of the jail and kind of bond with the animals. I think it's therapeutic for them as well. We also have community service programs. So people that have court order community service hours can complete those hours at the shelter. We do some TNR when we can. Um, so what we'll do is we'll help track feral cats We'll neuter them, uh, make sure that they are FIV and FBLV negative, and then release them back into their community. We do have a food assistance program as well. 
Um, any pet owner in Lake County that is low income receiving uh, any, type, any type of assistance, they can come in if they can pass a background check and they can prove that they are receiving assistance from any governmental agency. We will provide them with food, litter, treats, leashes, whatever they need to keep the animal in the home because we don't want them to have to give up their pet. Um, so those people will come to us once a month and we keep food aside for them and we pass out food. Um, we also have an enrichment program that we're really proud of. Because our animals are kept caged and we know it's not fair for them to be in a cage, we ensure that all of our dogs and cats are receiving mental stimulation, visually, um, auditory, and through touch as well. So every single staff member, every volunteer, even the inmates from the jail that come and help, um, we have an enrichment calendar that we have put together for both species, and every single animal gets several forms of enrichment throughout the day. So if you ever walk through the shelter, you'll see our animals have um, tons of stuff in their cages that look like garbage, but they love it. Um, we'll take like newspaper and crumple it up and put treats in the middle, and the dogs get the chance to shred it and do all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so that's about it. That's animal control. Um, it's a little bit of the lighter work with the sheriff's department. If anybody has any questions, we're here. This is it. Uh, what we're going to do here is actually have an opportunity to see the helicopter and then uh, I have a list of the names that I uh, have a tour. For those of you who put their names down for the tour of the jail, also I'm going to try to figure out how we're going to, if you want to, how we're going to go to the... Uh, Crime lab. Crime lab. Okay. The, just a limited amount. I think I have a list there too. So. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want, what we can do is I'll uh, go out there right now, meet out there the, where the helicopters are at. So take a look at that. I'll make some phone calls and start getting uh, uh, them ready for the jail tour and uh, and tour for uh, crime lab. So Deputy so Chief, uh, yeah, we're going out there right now to start uh, preparing for the jail tour and the tour of crime lab. Okay. At this point, let me say this, you know, I want to thank everyone here in this department because you know what, uh, all of you, I think you've learned a good lesson. I think the Vice Chancellor was here and she said, wow, before she left, she was telling me that. So again, thank you very much to everybody.